This is Judge Joe Brown, and you're watching We All Be News TV, the News Free Dixie. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. And you see, that's like a hood rat. A Go hood on. rat is like a lesbian in a boy's body. The lesbian and these boys are raised like girls. Mm. They have girl values, but they both like girls sexually. It's just the boys have boy plumbing. Mm -hmm. If you had a fairy godmother who could wave a magic wand over a lesbian so she'd wake up in a boy's body tomorrow morning, you'd have no difference. <laughs> wow. And that's very bad in our community because it's a matriarchy. You know, 82% of the children born to black parents are uh, biological parents under 20 in America. 82% are illegitimate. There's no daddy at all. So just think about it. That means 82% of the young people in America that are black are not likely to get man training. And the man training is not just for the boys. The presence of the man is necessary for the girls to grow up to be healthy. Well, uh, mm. It's like this. See, you get a girl who likes daddy. Even if she gets stuck without a man, at least, She's got an idea of what her boy is supposed to grow up to be, so right. she can at least go get what he needs, and she's got a grandfather, uncles, or brothers she can go to or know what kind of boyfriend to be bothered with. But if you have a girl raised where there's no father around, a grandfather, what happens is instead of the girl who does have a daddy figure, Saying, Daddy, could I have five dollars? Oh, baby, I'll just give you ten dollars day before yesterday. Daddy, please, could I have five dollars? Look, girl, here's twenty. Now don't bother me the rest of the week, okay? Yes, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> you see, she'll grow up to be a good woman. She'll know how to handle men, know how to deal with her sons. The ones that don't come up around men, when they get grown and they're trying to deal with a male, they put a hand on the hip and get the rag waggling their head. Look here, let me tell you what I'm going to make you do. You hear me? And that is not going to work. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about what you're saying just now. I'm thinking to myself, how, what's the percentage of, of the children being born out of wedlock? What's the percentage of black males helping these children? Well, the problem is, is when 82% of the children or the young youth in black communities in America, 20 and under, are born out of wedlock, what do you think? It's a mess. So, man, like, what, is, what, what do black males, I mean, like, a lot of black men don't have kids as well. So, well, yeah, they don't. Mm -hmm. See, it's like that, by the way, has got a lot to do with politics. Like in Shelby County, one mm -hmm. prominent black uh, politician had 18 outside children right. through juvenile court. Another one, a prominent one, had 14. Even a former white mayor had two half black kids through junior juvenile court. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like this was a white mayor. He's dead now. But I mean, just so about Crump. No, I'm talking about much more recently. Oh, okay. Um, Chandler? <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names. Okay. At this time. Uh -huh. uh, but anyway, you have this problem. Some people are unsure of their masculinity, so they attempt to prove it by 
a fecundity. I've got a lot of children, therefore I'm a man, rather than I support the ones I do have. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they don't try, but one of the problems with this mix of the 82% is that there's not a joint choice. See, they've got a doctrine called intentionality, and that's where, let's say, somebody donated sperm to a sperm bank or somebody intentionally donated sperm to a woman who wanted to get artificially inseminated. Well, she got pregnant as she intended and says, well, I'm going to go sue the daddy for child support. Said, oh, no. I didn't intend to do that. I just donated sperm. And the courts across the country have come up with this doctrine of intentionality. It was not the man's intention at the time he donated sperm to a sperm bank or directly to this woman through a clinical procedure that he be the father. Well, that doctrine really needs to be extended so when the paternity is at the intent of the mother but not at the father he just gets trapped because you see there is this thing about the sexual revolution that occurred in the 60s birth control had just come along in the early 60s and nobody got pregnant uh, women had sex they had abortions they passed out birth control pills freely i remember working for the first Head Start program in L.A. in 1965 is an assistant teacher. They required all of the mothers to come in for birth control classes, and they got them birth control pills, foam, and various other contraceptives, and they saw to it. That was part of the requirement of having your kid in there. Then these right-wing, overly religious type got control of those things in the country and it's caused problems like for example one of our big problems is type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. that crosses all ethnic lines and especially us and the mexicans too type 1 diabetes well mm -hmm. you know it's very expensive taking invocana and canumid xr and Trulicity and all of that other stuff. But tragically, because these overly religious right wing neocon types have banned any stem cell research or collection of fresh stem cells, we can do nothing about it except by expensive medication. You go to Hong Kong or Singapore where the People's Republic of China controls the area and for $150,000 you can get genetically modified so you know not are cured you no longer are a diabetic 100 percent wow you don't have to take any medication the rest of your life they change you genetically they introduce a genetically vi uh, modified virus which modifies all of your cells and then it doesn't do anything until you get treated with a fresh stem cell course so your body can use them to correct its problem so you're not a diabetic but we can't do that in america wow that's amazing so you may but people with with means can go over there right like yes they can mm. that's like they want to outlaw abortion but half of these clowns that are against it they send their daughters to Switzerland or across to another state where nobody has a problem with it. Like they'll send them out to California all the time to get abortions. A lot of these young little rich white uh, girls whose daddies are these Baptist preachers, they go out to California, come back, no problem. They like to say, well, Jimmy Carter had that so-called inoperable brain cancer or whatever, now it's cured. Well, all kinds of things can happen with uh, gene therapy, but you need fresh stem cells mm. to do to grow to match the new gene code. That is fascinating stuff. I mean, so what do you think about it? Do you, do you believe there's a cure for cancer out there? Well, I think they're going to get a handle on it, but the problem is, is even if you go to a museum and look at dinosaur skeletons, you see that 
65, 85, 95, 120 million years ago, these animals were suffering from cancer. Mm. There are all sorts of reasons for people getting cancer. They come from viral infections. They come from uh, too much exposure to ultraviolet light. You get skin cancers. You get exposed to chemicals and harsh things in the environment. Your genes may just get out of control and, and something doesn't grow right. So the problem with getting a cure for cancer is that it's not cancer singular. It's a multiplicity of ailments that all are called cancer. So it's a process of getting a handle on one type of cancer, another type of cancer, and another type, and that's going to take time. But you see, one of our problems is is we can't use all of the potential therapies because the neocon hyper-religious type that runs the political process in Washington, D.C. has forbidden it. You know, I think about what you just said. Well, Nancy Reagan, she was forced to himself research of all people because of what happened to Ronald Reagan. Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ronald Reagan was the right wing uh, saint, but he was brain dead. He didn't know what he was doing, and he was a Hollywood type. So, you know, the whole Hollywood nine yards about stars and their fantasies. And see, I saw Reagan speak three times over two consecutive days, we picketed him. It was 1968. And each time he said, Al, Al, have you got my speech? I can't seem to find it. I must have lost my speech. Well, my friends, I guess I'll have to ad lib this. Please excuse me, but I think I can recall my point. And he said that each one of the three speeches, he said the exact same thing. He stumbled the same place in each speech. He coughed. He scratched his head. And most interestingly of all, interesting of all, he dropped his pen the same place in each speech. So those of us who had been picketing and had seen these three speeches came to the conclusion, wow, this guy doesn't just have a speech writer. He's got a script writer. He's an actor. He's playing a part. No wonder he gets everything because, like, you can get a star playing a submarine commander, a pilot, a cowboy, a sheriff, or a bad man, or playing the role of governor and eventually playing the role of president. Somebody's writing a script. But, you know, in the movie, you accept him as a submarine commander. In the movie, you accept him as a fighter pilot. In the movie, you accept him as a cowboy. In the movie, you accept him as a rogue cowboy. In the movie, you accept him as the sheriff. You know, you accept him as the priest. You accept him as the businessman in his B-grade movies. You know, nobody else is competing for the ratings. He plays the role of somebody who would be a good governor. Somebody's writing the script for him. And that performance where he gave the same exact words over three occasions for three of the same speeches where he said he lost his speech. Yeah, I, Reagan was interesting. You say all that. I was thinking about uh, like sometimes like, he was good at working the press like when, when they ask him a question, worked the press. He had a little IFB bud in his ear. Okay, it's a receiver. It looks like a hearing aid. Okay, and yeah, you hear yeah. what somebody is saying. I used to have one occasionally, and I take it out. Uh huh. And somebody, some of the executive producers who want to keep talking in the ear, taking it out. I want to hear this. You know, so they would talk to him. And they would have to have a blackout in there so nobody had a radio receiver to hear it. Mm. So I know sometimes, though, like, well, I know it's like he'll, ask a, he'll answer a question he wants to answer, but then somebody asks him, like, a hard question. He, like, he actually couldn't hear him. 
Like he couldn't hear. Yeah, I, exactly. He, <laughs> he didn't want to hear. Like I can't hear. Right. So they made a point. That he's wearing a hearing aid. No, that was IFB. But <laughs> this guy's is a hearing aid, and they say he was hard of hearing. That's because he didn't have any ideas. He's follow. He's an actor. He's playing a role that somebody else has created. And also, what are your, what are your thoughts about his uh, campaign? A campaign guy, the guy known as Lee Atwater. He was an interesting Atwater, character. Atwater, Roe, and what is the fool that got shot? Uh, uh Bray, Brayley, uh, Brad, was Brady, Brady, Brady. Okay. Brady. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a bigger bunch of reprehensible rogue scoundrels you have never come up with, particularly mm. that Carl Rove talking about. Uh, worldwide pollution is caused by cows farting, or that one that Reagan pushed out. I don't understand all of the clamor. These children getting free lunches are getting a well-balanced lunch. They are getting ketchup. Isn't that a valid vegetable? <laughs> Damn ignorant fool. No, it goes through like you like a, a granddaddy. So what about Reagan that people like? I, mean, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> His acting was horrible. Mm-hmm. And he played these predictable parts. He never was a big-time actor. He played in what they call B-movies, in other words, second-rate movies. He was in the wartime military propaganda unit, and that's mm-hmm. what he did. Before the war, he had ROTC when he was coming through college, and he was a radio announcer before he went Hollywood. He was in ROTC, and he did two years as a reserve officer in the cavalry. Mm. So he could ride a horse. He translated that into doing all of these parts as a cowboy. Now, the other thing was he got into politics, and he was a snitch. He's the one that snitched on all of the other Hollywood people about them being too liberal and left-wing, therefore they must be commies. That's when that whole thing came up with Joe McCarty uh, in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. Him out there trying to expose commies. Well, Ronald Reagan, when he was uh, leadership for SAG Screen Actors Guild, was snitching on people and playing funky to that fool McCarty. He lost a lot of friends in Hollywood over that. Well, he was a B-grade actor. He acted in the wartime propaganda movies like Run Silent, Run Deep. He played the submarine commander. And what's interesting is when he ran against Carter, they put him up as Carter was the peanut farmer and a crank, and Reagan was the war hero, the submarine commander, and all he did was act the part in a movie, propaganda movie. But the tragedy was, Jimmy Carter graduated first in his class at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And before he retired, he was acting Commodore for the North Atlantic Ballistic Missile Submarine Fleet. He really was down in that hunt for the Red October stuff in a nuclear submarine parked under the ice. Wow. But, you know, we had Ronnie Reagan as the war hero, and he never faced the bullet, anything. And then we've got Jimmy Carter, who in the Cold War was playing tag with Russian nuclear attack submarines. See, I also heard a load, load of extermination on board, 16 Polaris uh, missiles. Mm. I also was reading uh, online, like almost for 20 years ago, there was like people were talking about that Ronald Reagan allegedly raped an a actress when he was the president of the Screens Actors Guild. Like he raped yeah. her on his couch. Well, that was I, yeah, well, that that that's, was so common. I remember my headquarters were over at what's now KTLA Channel 5 mm-hmm. on Sunset near Van Ness, right? Uh, a block west of the 101 freeway. Mm. And it used to be Warner Brothers Studios back in the 20s and early 30s. So where I had my headquarters, they called the Plantation Mansion because it looked like it. Mm. And when they decided to renovate it, they took the sheetrock off. 
So we were surprised to find these stairs down to underground passages with old yellow paper taped to the walls with direction to, you know, Teddy Bear's uh, bungalow and uh, this star's bungalow and that star's bungalow where Cecil B. DeMille, the famous old-time director, would go over there and do the casting couch thing secretly and nobody could see him. And the tunnels went up and they were blocked off now by coverings where they had just asphalted over there. Mm. Uh, Gene Harlow, you know, that kind of thing. He'd go over there and pay visits and get the nookie. Mm. Casting couch was a reality, but now the casting couch is LGBT stuff. I know a woman, a beautiful woman, but she's really stone cold hard now. She had a white husband who was uh, an executive producer who rose up in Hollywood. And she talks about all of the penis that she uh, sucked and fellatio and all of the executives she screwed to get her husband ahead. She never wants to see a penis again, so she's a full-fledged, full-time lesbian. Mm. And I can remember sitting at a table at a party when the show first started back in 98, 99, somebody's birthday party at a big club, and I was sitting at this table with all of these beautiful soap opera and movie stars and I was grinning. I was a bachelor and they were grinning at me and I was having a good time. And this very beautiful woman bounced up to the sage and said to another woman that was sitting one over from me that I had my eye on. She said, Oh, Susan, Oh, Susan, here, I'm so horny. Can I come over Tuesday and have you eat me out? God, I just need an orgasm so badly. I said, Oh man. And one of the girls grinned at me and said, oh, we forgot to tell you, we like the taste of, you know, basically, she didn't use that word, but uh, she used the P word. She said, we like to taste the nookie. We didn't tell you, but we like you, you're cool. I said, oh, man, wow. That's so amazing. that was the stock and trade. And see, a lot of what's going on when you look at some of the Hollywood stars is, I hate to see a woman abused, but the bottom line is, is you hear this thing, I had my dream, I always wanted to do this. Well, develop talent so you can get there on your talent. You don't have to use sex to skip the talent part. Or I remember one of them just recently was complaining about it was unfair how she was abused. She had always wanted to play this woman, play this role, and she had her heart set on it. And the woman was a, a kind of a crazy woman. And historically, she was a lesbian, even though she was married. So she got all worked up when the director insisted that she do this nude love scene uh, with another woman to fulfill the lesbian part of the real story. Uh, Selma Hayek or Hayek with uh, Frida Kahlo. You talking about the Frida Kahlo movie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you could object. They could have put a body double in there. You could say, no, I'm not going to do that movie. A lot of actors have said, I just don't do those kind of things. And that's it. But nobody made you. Well, I always had my heart set. Well, too bad. Hollywood is fantasy. Go get a job in the real world. Right. You know. But I am against anything that's forcible. You know, you don't have to creep out and give everybody a manhood a bad name. That's wrong. But some of this stuff, remember, the contributor to Team Vogue, it's okay to make a false accusation and ruin a man if it helps out the feminist cause. Look at Allred and Bloom and all of the women that they've induced to come forward 30 years after they did something and didn't complain about it then, all of a sudden they get talked in on the promise of money. Now they are offended. And they keep going back. You know, like if a guy was doing you wrong, why do you go back three or four times? And I think as a man, I say, look, let's get real. I like to be real. I don't care whether I step on somebody's toes or not. Uh, reality is reality. I'm a grown man. 
I'm a mature man. I'm not unattractive. I have some style. I mm-hmm. had money, and when I was a bachelor, yeah, I tried to get over, but mm-hmm. I got refused more than I got accepted. So I'm looking at all these super fine stars. How is it that these ugly, fat, out of shape guys with ugly faces get the nookie and, you know, so easily? And that is not my real world experience. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I said, okay. You know, let's be real. There's a degree in here from some serious stuff, which is wrong, way wrong, no excuse for it. Somebody should actually be punished. And over here on the other side, it's not that nobody, anybody made you do it. You're just remorseful. I remember when they had that thing on Cosby and they had those women on the magazine cover, Mm -hmm. all of those women, and I looked at some of them. I say, I recognize this one, this one, this one, this one. I said, I remember some times when I come back to L.A. in the 70s, taking a little vacation time, and I went to some of these Hollywood parties. And the woman would walk in with a see-through blouse on with a jacket. She'd take the jacket off. She didn't have a bra on. There were no pockets. You'd see her nipples, everything else, not just the outline. You could see them like through a sheer pair of stockings or fishnet. Mm -hmm. and low slung pants, which were the style then, and in half hour, she'd have the pants off, and she'd be running around in thong panties with a chain around her waist, and then the top would come off, and then the panties would come off, and there would be only the chain, and you'd go to get something out of your coat that's in a bedroom on a bed, and she's screwing somebody on the bed. And then 45 minutes later, you go to the bathroom to take a pee, and she's in there doing somebody in the bathroom. And you might run into the same woman the third time. She's doing somebody in a closet. And then, you know, you, you're you out there for two weeks taking your time, and you go to another party, and she's there doing the same thing. She was being a groupie, and the term that they used was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or sex, drugs, and athletes, sex, drugs, and TV star, sex, drugs, and movie star. Mm-hmm. So they were getting what they wanted. It's just they may have had a remorse later. There was one woman that briefly got in the movies. She worked as a bartender at a place called Sports Page, and she was notorious for giving head jobs behind the bar and going back to the kitchen area and screwing some important executive types, and she finally made the movie. She screwed her way in there. Everybody knew it. Mm-hmm. So you get these kind of things. It's been happening for years, and I don't think anybody made that woman. I didn't see anybody make that woman do it. She did it on her own. And when I was out there, I didn't participate in that stuff, so they try to set you up so they could get a handle on you. But I saw all of the homosexual stuff like that where they were doing it like the old-time casting couch, but it wasn't boy-girl. It was boy-boy or girl-girl. Mm-hmm. And very, very seldom you got a straight guy in there, but he acted at his peril. And some of these guys, some of the things they did were just plain stupid and wrong, but a lot of this is hyped. You know, there's no excuse for doing a woman wrong, but, you know, there's no excuse for just throwing out an accusation years after the fact of doing something that amounts to flirting, which at the time it was done, uh, the law read, it's no harm in asking once. You know, well, so. well, man, I actually did about the Tavis Smiley situation where they, you know, PBS did that independent investigation and they claimed that he had uh, unprofessional, like, you know, having sexual relationship with subordinates. And, he, you know, he lost all his you know, sponsors and underwriters to his well, show. You know, the general rule I would tell people, don't dip your wick in the company ink. <laughs> bad move you'll have to work with them and they might get peeved if you get an affair with somebody else and then they're going to come back at you that's a dumb move 
what about the fantasy? Like, what about the, like, what Obama, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama was his boss at one point when they yeah, started dating. ain't that something. There you go. <laughs> so, they, why, why, is that the exception? Was they married at times for not oh, marrying the girl? But mm-hmm. you see, here's the other thing. Have you ever heard of a guy complaining about a woman made me have sex with her? I one time DMX, but that he's the exception, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, look at him. He said he was raped while he was sleeping or something like that. Like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> is he was he complaining about it? <laughs> I mean, his, his, my, his, hey, something else said, okay, his little head said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you see, the bottom line is, is if somebody talking about they made me have sex, I said, oh, man, come on, you need to check your masculinity. As much as folks can play about like erectile dysfunction, you think you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I mean, other thing too. Yeah. Uh, I've heard people these gays just on side say you didn't bust somebody in his mouth. Mm. You know, sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do. He just needs the wisdom to know when he's got to do it. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. But if you're not getting that man training, there's a problem there. But you see, it gets back to that whole equality thing. Mm-hmm. Legally, men and women are equal, but they're not the same. Viva right. la différence, the French say. Right. Uh, women are not as strong as men. There's a thing called sexual dimorphism. Men are bigger, stronger on average than women. Mm-hmm. So they need to get the idea that the yin-yang balance is an important thing. You can't come at a man a certain way because when you do that, your safety becomes dependent upon his good will. Right. You see, women did not force and acquire the right to vote. An all-male electorate gave it to them. Mm. Women cannot protect themselves from men except in small exceptions. Men are acculturated and socialized to indulge and support women. But these feminists want to forget that reality. And it's like, okay, you're going to put yourself in a situation where you do know that if you were a guy, and this was a normal guy, that you were doing this too, he would have busted you in your mouth. Well, you keep on pushing it that way, he may forget that you are a woman and listen to your feminist ranting and believe you are fully equal and bust you in your mouth. And remember, you like Wonder Woman where she jacks up five, six dudes before breakfast to work (laughs) up an appetite. Right. You know, you could put them in the military and combat units. They're supposed to take a bullet like the guys are supposed to. So you get these young people that you have acculturated and conditioned to go for this, they come out, you know, you got a problem with domestic violence because the woman isn't a woman in their eyes. She's just like the guys, except she's got a nookie, but you can treat her like you treat guys. You know, the guys get out of hand. They got a fight behind the roadhouse. Mm. But you can't do that with women. And some of these people need to get that in their heads. That's a reality of life. Hey, you there saying that? A, go ahead, sorry. There is a rule with this. Women and children are a resource. Men protect them, provide for them, and are expendable. What do they say when the ship's sinking? Women and children in the lifeboats first. Mm. So if you want that to happen, there are ways to ensure that that happens. If you don't care so the guys could get in the lifeboat before the women and children, and you can see who can get in the lifeboat, who can throw somebody out of the lifeboat to take their seat, (laughs) then you can play that too. But, you know, you don't really want that. It's 2.17 a.m. in the morning, and there's a nice two-story townhouse you have I knew you hear glass breaking, and somehow or another the alarm didn't go off because somebody cut the wires leading out of the house, and it's obvious somebody is inside that doesn't need to be there downstairs 
wouldn't it be nice to have the strong man that knows how to take care of business laying next to you to go down and see about the problem? Or do you as a woman want to be the one that's got to deal with? Mm. You see, that's the bottom line. The bottom line is, is yeah, women probably provided more food by gathering and, you know, preparing the food than the men did from hunting. But the thing of it was is, you know, saber-toothed tigers, bear, wolves, lions, tigers had a taste for human flesh. So it was up to the hunters to make sure that those things didn't eat too many people. I mean, for most of human existence, mankind lived in a real-life horror movie, you know, like in the middle of the night, something horrible creeps in and snatches you. But it's a real live four footed animal with large size, large teeth, large mouth, large amount of strength, and a large appetite for people. So who's going to go get them? It wasn't the women that went after them, it was the men. Because they were stronger. For what it's worth. Yeah, I was, when you said that, I was just thinking about the fact uh, this comedian named Joe Rogan, he was joking about the fact. That he would not want a woman to guard him if he was president in the Secret Service. <laughs> it made it made like a joke about it. People say, "Oh my God!" Then like what he said made a lot of sense. You know, because he's talking about. I'm an old school guy. I'll look at it this way. I'll respect women. I have uh, female lawyers, got female doctors, dentists. You know, they're cool. Mm -hmm. But I'm not gonna have a woman for a boss. No how, no way. I will not work for a woman. Somebody Good. says, we'll give you $5 million starting off on this with a $20 million bonus. If you do this, we'll lose the ball. No, I'm sorry. I can't do that. But you're so outdated, Judge. You're behind the times, what people tell you. I mean, no, you know, I don't care. I'm a man. <laughs> I'm a man. I have been occasions when I've had to stand and deliver, and I didn't run. I'm satisfied with my personal bravery. There have been some physical moments. Mm-hmm. One of these days, I'll write in a book what happened a couple of times when I had a James Earl Ray case. It got quite lethal. I believe I you, Walt. Wow. Yeah. I didn't flinch. But the bottom line is, is a man should have the opportunity to have rites of passage or moments to prove himself so he becomes comfortable with his bravery. In other words, when the stuff hits the fan, I know that I'll stand up. I mean, right now, I might not rationalize it, and I can come up with all kinds of reasons why not. But when the crunch time comes, what I usually do is, you know, hell, do me, you know. Right. Or I'm going to do you. You know, or I'm going to take somebody to Val Hollow when we go out, you know. Yea, though, I have a personal attitude. Yea, though, I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I fear no evil because I'm the baddest somebody in this damn valley, or at least I'm comporting myself like it and I'm willing to deliver so that if you want to test me, you know, man's got to do what a man's got to do and have the wisdom to know when he's got to do it. You might take me out or I might take you out or we both might go, but it's going to get real interesting. Right. And you see, I just can't have an attitude. I've spent my whole life, you know, learning these fine arts of how to do this kind of stuff. You know, you can take martial arts. You can go instead of buying, you know, some $180 Air Jordan, $200 tennis shoes, you can forego four pair of them, get yourself a nice pistol and a 12-gauge, 18-inch barrel shotgun, Mossberg 500 or 590, and then get you an AR platform, learn how to shoot the bloody doggone thing, and, you know, you don't have to worry about anything. You can handle your situation and stay yourself straight. Go get a handgun carry permit. You okay. You know, it was interesting. It was a brother from Philadelphia. He was in Memphis over the weekend. Uh, he started a movement called Black Guns Matter. He's a bills of rights, you know, a gun advocate, you know, a very articulate young brother. And uh, people sign up for it in Memphis. I forgot uh, it was one of the community centers in North Memphis. Uh, 200 people signed up. It was a free event, but only 12 people showed up. 
So he was kind of disappointed. But if you listen to him online, it's like he got his, you know, he, he, he makes a very important case for uh, black folks arming themselves with guns, but also, you know, understanding the law and your rights. Yes, we need to take advantage of the law. I, I, I'm a criminal court judge. I can tell you, the police can't stop you from being killed. Only thing they can do is draw a white chalk outline around your body. Right, he's still at the scene in front of him. Dead, and baby, catch who did it if the fool runs his mouth off and brags about it. Right. Uh, you can't protect your family. Like that no retreat doctor. You know what that's about? No, sir. A man's walking with his wife when somebody comes to hold him up. And he might have a handgun carry permit. But if you've got a retreat rule, then he's supposed to take off and run and try to get away. What's he supposed to do? Leave his wife there? Leave his mother there? Leave his children there? Hmm. Leave his girlfriend there while the bandit takes her out? No. So they have all of these qualifications. There's less than 10 states that ever had a duty to retreat. So what they would have is, the man retreated because he moved his left heel back a half inch. That's sufficient for a retreat. He turned as though to remove himself. That's a sufficient retreat because the realistic rule uh, is that you can't leave your loved ones to be harmed by a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And some well-meaning idiots who in that state were able to prevail upon an unwise legislature to pass a retreat doctrine are foolish people. And it doesn't work in the real world. So, by the way, Tennessee's had a no-retreat doctrine for 150 years. Mm -hmm. So you charge the jury on a murder trial and a self-defense claim, you say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant has raised the defense of self-defense. You are advised that he has no duty to retreat. He may stand his ground, except for that's the first thing in the charge. So some states just advertised it, but that's the law. So you get Anderson Cooper salaciously trying to generate ratings, and he starts talking about the evils of the no retreat doctrine. And as I mentioned earlier, Zimmerman did not have the right. It was Trayvon Martin who didn't have to retreat when Zimmerman approached him on the run and attacked him. And it was Trayvon Martin who, under the uh, Florida self-defense laws, had the right to take Zimmerman's life when Zimmerman assaulted him, and Trayvon discovered that he had a pistol in his waistband, and he pounded Zimmerman's head into the sidewalk to put him in a state where he could no longer continue his aggression. And by the way, that's just exactly what you see in this recent video out of Pasadena where one cop's got his knee in this guy's back and is ramming his face in the sidewalk repeatedly. Mm. Wow. So, you know. Well, well my actually is about speaking of, uh, you know, crimes and murder. What is your take on this Lorenzo Wright thing? Well, the all this, you know, his wife got arrested out in Cali and guy Billy Ray Turner was arrested a week or so ago. What are, you, what are your thoughts about this case? I don't know anything personally about the facts of the case. I have not personally interviewed any witnesses. I have not reviewed any statements. I know even if I had, I have adopted as a working principle in my life, an individual is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty. And there has been no such proceeding to give this man who is the suspect his due process. So as a former criminal court judge, former defense counsel, former chief public defender for the city of Memphis, and the first black prosecutor for the city of Memphis, I know better. So the, the same goes for his wife, uh, Lorenzo Wright. I have no idea. And 
put that in the context of the news media will falsify, exaggerate, withhold, so they can generate ratings. You cannot rely on what you hear in the media to set up an accurate picture of what went on, especially now. They've always been bad, but they are particularly bad now. Yes, sir. I heard that's wisdom. Like, that was like that, uh, what's the name? Um, the, what was one? It's on me. One that was accused of killing her daughter. I know you're talking about Casey, Casey Anthony. Anthony. Yeah. yeah. And Nancy Grace was standing on the woman's side, well, the family sidewalk for several years with a loud healer saying, we have a right to know she should tell us what happened. And all of these people were pontificating about how she was going to be convicted. And the jury, when they got the case, said they never showed where this kid got killed, how this kid got killed, even if the kid did it. They didn't show how she did it, when she did it, where she did it, why she did it, or if she did it. So we had to acquit her. We followed the law. We had a reasonable doubt. And everybody for five years that this case was pending was hollering about she's guilty. She needs to be up under a penitentiary. Mm. They talked about O.J., Mm -hmm. uh, they still do, but that was Nancy Grace again, who was the reporter, scoundrel that made America think O.J. was guilty. Mm -hmm. See, I got a chance to see all of the evidence. Somebody I recruited to law school just happened to be chief administrative judge for L.A. Superior Courts. So she let me see the evidence. First off, uh, the photos they had showed that Goldman and... Uh, O.J.'s wife had their throat slit from ear to ear, and somebody had pulled their tongues out of the slit throats. Otherwise, they each had one knife wound going into the right upper chest that ripped up the aorta and the top two chambers of the knife. It was a pro that did it. I have a friend who was called by the state as an expert in knife killing. He looked at it and said it had to be two people. One man couldn't do it. And by the way, at the scene, in the blood, you've got footprints from somebody that had a size 9 shoe and somebody else had a size 10 and a half and O.J. wears a 12. Mm -hmm. If it does not fit, you must acquit. I know the guy that made the gloves, his name is Richard Zuckerwar. Everybody gave a hand tracing. O.J. took a size 2XL in that glove. It was a size large, not extra large, not 2XL. Furman wore a size large. OJ's hand was too big. Mm. Bottom line is bloody socks at the foot of the bed. That's one of the things that killed the case. What the jury saw and what Nancy Grace and none of the news media reported on, though it was in the stuff that I recorded from the live broadcast of the trial, was this. At about 1.14, the security squad goes in to video the crime scene. Why? Because people, uh, well, people complained that LAPD would steal their property. Does LAPD steal it? Well, that's how O.J. wound up going to jail. He was in Vegas and found that LAPD had stolen several of his items of property, Super Bowl rings, autograph, pictures, certificates. Mm -hmm. So the security squad videoed it. They showed the foot of the bed with no bloody socks, 114. About five minutes later, this video, by the way, has audio. You could hear, excuse me, who are you? Detective Furman. Uh, excuse me, will Detective Fur no, Furman. Well, Detective Furman, you have to leave the premises until we finish our work. Well, I'm said, sir, sir, we don't care. You have to leave. A few minutes later, sir, what are you doing in the bedroom, Detective Furman, in the bedroom? And then they pan the camera over. You can see Furman at the foot of this bed that you just got through seeing had no bloody socks. Well, they leave, and later crime scene comes through and videos everything. And now after you've seen no bloody socks at 114, 
five, ten minutes later, you've seen Furman at the foot of this same bed. Now crime scene shows bloody socks at the foot of the bed. Now who put them there? Oh. OJ's on an airplane. Hmm. And the press did not cover the fact that four of the chief detectives wound up going to jail in what they called a rampart scandal for planting false evidence on suspects. They had to let 128 men out of California penitentiary because of that. And four of the chief detectives involved in that were chief detectives in the OJ case. Mm. Did Johnny Cochran raise the race issue? No, but what he did do is he selected people of 45, 50 some years old who had grown up in LA and knew how corrupt and wrongdoing LAPD was. See, if you grew up in Los Angeles, uh, I suppose it was like being of an unapproved religion in Nazi Germany. It was like, where are your papers? We don't see your papers. Yeah, Fritz, he does not have these papers. But I can see here your papers. Man, what papers? I mean, what are you talking about? You do not have your papers? That's not Gutum, yeah? You know, it's like, good gracious. Mm. Wow. I grew up in L.A. I have very bad experiences. It was so bad that like another bunch of people I know that grew up in L.A., to this day, we're 65, 70, 75 years old. We still have a, a nightmares about getting jacked up by LAPD. I still, to this day, sometimes yeah. have a nightmare about I'm caught in L.A. for some reason, for some mess, and there are some detectives that are going to try to get me and do some wrong to me. L.A., is that bad? Was that bad? Or? It, it was that bad. Uh -huh. It's so, it's so beautiful out there, though. I guess, you know. Yeah, but yeah. But I can remember, <laughs> I can remember coming back in '75 for a vacation, and somebody saying, "We're in the hood, man. What's wrong? Huh? Where are the trees? Yeah, man. They cut the trees down so the helicopters can patrol at the rooftop level. Helicopters? Yeah, I remember being in law school five years before." I come out of my apartment, blink, instant daylight, boom, 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 loudspeaker. That's the helicopter. This is a police vehicle. A ground unit will arrive shortly. Remove your identification and hold it in your right hand. Wow. Make no furtive movements or the officers will act accordingly. Now, how many places do the young folk know what furtive movement means? He did in L.A. Man, you hear about Earl? Man, oh, man. Uh, LAPD shot him 17 times, man. What happened, man? D didn't care no piece. I know, man. He was unarmed, but he made a fatal furtive, man. Furtive oh, movement. Mm. We used to call it the fatal furtive. What happened, man? The stomp. Oh, man, he made a fertile, uh, he made a fatal furtive, man. They shot him seven times. Wow. Well, I, as an officer, was approaching the suspect. He made a furtive movement as though to reach for a revolver. In fearing for my life, I drew my service revolver and fired six shots, reloaded and fired six more until he was not moving. And I thought the threat had been diminished to the point where I was safe. I checked the suspect and I acted in error. He did not have a gun, but I was in fear of my life because he made a furtive movement. Nobody ever got prosecuted in L.A. for shooting somebody. Well, I saw I was investigating a criminal case with two other guys for this law professor who was doing a pro bono criminal defense. We went to talk to some witnesses. And we we're standing on the porch talking to these witnesses. And a guy drove up in a brand new Cutlass, Oldsmobile Cutlass, just drove it off the lot. And he parked and he came over and he was bragging about the car. Well, while we were standing there, 
This drunk drives down the street, size fights four or five cars, including his, and really damages them, and then rams the phone pole and wrecks his car, and he staggers out of the car and collapses into a stupor over the hood of his wrecked car. Well, well LAPD got called, took them an hour to get there. Two squad cars with two cops. They didn't want to be bothered. They didn't feel like writing it up because they were at the end of their shift. This sergeant came. The sergeant said, well, you know, your problem. You don't need a new car anyway. You know, black people, you're getting out of hand, buying new cars and getting airs and outside of yourself. He said Ooh. something to that effect. The guy said, what the hell, man? I'm a citizen. This fool drunk. Look at him. He may be dead. Aren't you going to go look at him? Uh, we don't have the time. We've got more important things to do. He said, well, man, I, I'm complaining. I'm a citizen. He said, oh, okay. I'll tell you what. I'll give you something to complain about. He pulls his service revolver, jams it in the guy's left shoulder, and shoots him. He said, bam. Dude said, man, you shot me, man. He said, now you got something to complain about. He says, guys, let's go. So they leave. Wow. And we've got to call 911. They take the guy to the emergency room. Several days later, the law professor is pissed, and he gets involved pro bono again. So we go down to the precinct station, and we look through their book. It's supposed to have the pictures of everybody that's a cop at that precinct, all shifts. And interestingly enough, on the shift in question, there were three missing pictures. Mm. See, that's LAPD. I'm sure they've got some fine officers now. As a matter of fact, I had a first cousin, Keith Brown, who was a career cop with LAPD. He's all right, guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a couple of other all right guys, but the problem is there were a whole bunch that weren't. That's crazy. You see so, this movie, Mall Holland Drive, and you get the idea about LAPD. Mm -hmm. There's another one I forget the name of. The guy was in Amazing. It was a story about Sergeant Friday and the TV thing and a cop that was advising him who got killed. Big Hollywood scandal, but uh, that was even more on point about how they used to treat black folk mm. in L.A. It was horrible. Like Inglewood, everybody goes to the Ingl uh, to the wood, it's the hood. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up in uh, L.A., you couldn't drive through Inglewood after dark unless you had somebody's written note that you worked as a domestic for them. Wow. I mean, that was taking your life in your hands. I remember in the 60s, I'm a student at UCLA. I'm working for student government. There are three of us in the car. We're trying to go pick something up for a professor out in Anaheim, about half a mile from Disneyland. Well, it turned out the place was in the back alley, and we were having a hard time finding it, so a cop turned his lights on. We're in a state car. And he says, uh, may I help you, gentlemen? And we said, yeah, we're an officer. We're trying to find this address. He said, well, sir, I understand your problem. Everybody has a problem with that because it's in an alley. If you go down here, turn here, turn here, turn here. He says, now, it's winter, and it's about 4 o'clock. Let me suggest to you that you finish your business because if it's dark, it's not going to be sir anymore to any of you. It's going to be, and he said, the N-word. So uh, let me suggest you get out of here before dark. Now, that's a half a mile from Disneyland. Wow, it comes like that. Yes, that was the reality. Hmm. Everybody thinks California's are, like, hey, whoa. L.A. had the worst police in America. Oh, man. Cold blooded and root. Well, that was Henry Gates. I, I mean, Henry Gates came up through that. All right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I rem that was before Gates got in there. That was Chief Parker. They got oh, him yeah. out of Alabama. He came from Alabama with his twang. And he right. said, I'll have them down where they belong and us back on top. That was uh, always that was his statement. And he had his position for life for good behavior. That was the end of police corruption in L.A. But 
you know, and I remember in 1973, I was in Jackson, Mississippi, and I promise you, I pulled a recruitment poster for LAPD down off of a telephone pole and mailed it to some friends in L.A. Mm. Now, that's how cold-blooded that was. Mm. They were clinical, and they acted just like the Gestapo. Richard Pryor joked about it in one of his albums. LAPD pulls you over, said, on the wall, what wall? Find one. I can remember going to a fraternity sorority function. It was a ball. I had on a tux and my day had on a gown. It was one of the few days in L.A. it was raining. They made us lie on the wet sidewalk for 45 minutes while they were calling us in and going all through the car. I didn't find anything, but everything was out in the rain. Took the back seat out. Left it on the sidewalk. Just being low down. Oh, that's like, that is insane, man. Jesus. God, yeah, man. But that was it. That's routine. I mean, I had a, I, you turn around. And I look around, this guy's got a 38 point right in my face. Mm. This cop. What are you doing? I oh, said, I'm getting in my car. What's your driver? What's your license number? Fortunately, I remembered. Why are you driving this car? I said, because my old man said I could borrow his car. Because I got an important date. Any problem with that? I mean, it's like, what the hell? Or yeah. uh, the one thing, they had a double killing on campus at UCLA. Uh, there were two Panthers that were students, John Huggins and Bunchy Carter. Mm -hmm. and the US organization run by Ron Karinga, uh, the person that invented Kwanzaa, which I don't celebrate because he invented it. Mm -hmm. And he was a snitch out there. And he was killing all of the people that were making a difference in the community. And he had four guys gunned down uh, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins in the cafeteria of Campbell Hall, which was where they had the Minority Study Center. It was in broad daylight about high noon. Well, aside from what happened there, we had a guy who was the vice chancellor who for six months was the acting chancellor of the University of California with 60-some thousand full-time students. The main chancellor was taking a sabbatical for research. So the black guy has all of these chancellors from European universities over in the chancellor's conference room in a formal function. LAPD kicks in the closed doors with shotguns, takes the black acting chancellor, handcuffs him with his hands behind his back, jabbing him in the back with a 12-gauge shotgun, and they march him from the chancellor's office a mile and a half across campus in front of all of these white students, handcuffed with five cops dragging him along and one of them busting him in the back with a shotgun and handcuff him to a chair at the scene of the murder. Wow. You hear about LAPD. that? Part? Wow. They, I they, what happened? with my own two eyes. They oh, handcuffed me, put me in there too. Oh, they handcuffed you too? Yeah. They kept us handcuffed to a chair. Did they know who they were handcuffed? Like the Did they know that the guy was an acting chancellor at all? Yeah, they busted in the meeting. Oh, so they knew who he was and they did yeah. anyway. The wow. chancellor's conference room. They asked for him. We checked later. And they kicked the door in. And they had seven or eight chancellors from European universities in there, all dignified. You know, and they were serving champagne and lunch and all of the rest of this stuff. Oh, man. And they kicked in the door and they handcuffed him and shoved him like a dog in front of all these students a mile and a half across campus. Oh, man. So what was that? What happened afterward? I mean, how did the school respond? I mean, what did the chancellor say about it or do? 
Well, he was the chancellor. The other guy didn't come back for four months. So, I mean, like, what was the school? I mean, what was the response? How did they, that was done? Well, that was the anti-war period and all that. The students didn't like it, but LAPD would send the goon squad out there and just try to tramp through campus and mess with everybody. Oh, man. That's crazy. I mean, it was awful. I mean, they'd come through there and they'd have agitators. Somebody throw something. Watch it, man. What are you? What's the matter, man? What's wrong with you, man? Nobody's going to throw it. It is peaceful demonstration, man. <laughs> well, this accident, you're LAPD, man. I've seen you before. Wow. 